I'd like for you to turn to the book of Micah. In case you don't know, that's in the Old Testament. We study the sad history of the cyclical apostasies of the descendants of Jacob, commonly called the Israelites. It's difficult not to be harshly critical of their folly. God never did before, nor has he since, blessed a nation and chosen a nation as he did the descendants of Israel or Jacob. He, with a mighty hand, brought them out of slavery from Egypt and sent them on their way to a great land of promise, land flowing with milk and honey, which is a beautiful figure of an abundant land, a land of great freedom. And how disgracefully Israel began to squander her place of favoritism in the eyes of God when they were hardly out of the shadow of Egypt. For her unbelief, the entire generation of the Red Sea crossers, with only two notable exceptions, had to perish in the wilderness. The generation Joshua led across the Jordan and that God enabled to subdue Canaan seemed to be made of better material than its predecessor, uh, generation. But with the death of this godly man and the death of his generation, the inspired historian sadly reported in Judges 2, verses 10 and 11, and there arose another generation after them that knew not Jehovah, nor yet the work which he had wrought for Israel. And the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah and served the Balaam. The faithful, unfaithful cycles continued through the period of the judges. In fact, that is the summum bonum of that book. When God allowed the demands of the people for a king, these circumstances did not improve much. The monarchs of both the united and divided kingdoms were a corrupt and sorry lot for the most part, without exception in the northern kingdom and with few exceptions in the southern kingdom. Consequently, by the latter part of the 8th century B.C., God could no longer tolerate Israel's degeneracy. Thus, he allowed Assyria to overwhelm Israel in 72 B.C., ending its existence as an independent nation. But just prior to Israel's destruction, God called three men to prophesy. Isaiah was his city prophet in Jerusalem. Hosea was his prophet specifically to Israel, while the lesser-known Micah was a man of rural roots from the village of Moresheth in western Judah. Micah's message was directed at both Israel and Judah. Chapter 1, verse 1 of his book, Jerusalem and Samaria. He announced the doom of Israel, the reasons for it, and then presented these as object lessons to Judah that it might learn better and escape the same fate. The corruption in Israel was beyond repair, and fewer than 20 years following Micah's prophetic graphic description in Micah 1, verse 6, the Assyrians leveled the wicked capital of Samaria. Jeroboam corrupted the worship of God in Israel from the first day of its nationhood. The corruption was systemic, including golden calves as objects of worship, substitute temples, an unauthorized priesthood, and new feast days. It was an easy step then for Ahab and Jezebel a little later to introduce 
the nationwide worship of Baal. The moral and religious implosion suffered by Israel sealed its doom. History has shown that no nation, even one chosen and so blessed by God, can indefinitely survive without strong moral underpinnings. When these are ignored or abandoned, inevitable disintegration sets in and eventual moral collapse of the nation is certain. We can't help but think of our nation and the place where it is right now and say, wake up America. Despite some admixture with idolatry, Judah at least maintained the Levitical priesthood, the sacrificial system, and the feast days, all centered in the temple. It is evident, however, from the prophets of this period, especially Micah, that the religious practices were mere ritual, perfunctory and empty formalities. What they did in religion was not only cold and heartless ceremony, but it was also compartmentalized so that it had no impact on or connection with their daily lives. The princes, priests, and prophets were all involved in iniquity, but vainly tried to hide behind religion as if it were a talisman of some sort protecting them from God's wrath. And so in Micah chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, we read the prophet, They build up Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. The heads thereof judge for reward and the priests thereof teach for hire and the prophets thereof divine for money. Yet they lean upon Jehovah and say, Is not Jehovah in the midst of us? No evil shall come upon us. As were the leaders, so were the people who tolerated, supported, and even demanded such scoundrels. In chapter 2, verse 11, the people delighted in false prophets who would justify their drunkenness. Chapter 3, verse 5 tells us that such prophets made the people to err and took vengeance on those who would not feed them. Chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 says that men had grown wealthy by using wicked balances and deceitful weights by practicing violence and uttering lies. There were none good or upright left, and even the best of them, according to chapter 7, verses 2 through 4, was as useless and pain-inflicting as a briar. Against this backdrop of iniquity, God challenged people to explain their rebellion. And so in chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, Let's read. Hear ye now what Jehovah saith, Arise, contend thou before the mountains, and let the hills hear thy voice. Hear, O ye mountains, Jehovah's controversy, and ye enduring foundations of the earth, for Jehovah hath a controversy with his people Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. For I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of bondage. And I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember now what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. Remember from Shittim unto Gilgal that ye may know the righteous acts of Jehovah. So God condemned them for their ingratitude, reminding them of the many times he had delivered and saved them, thereby demonstrating his righteousness. The people responded in verses 6 and 7, we believe with sarcasm. Wherewith shall I come before thee, Jehovah, and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before thee with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will Jehovah be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn 
for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. Is this what you're requiring of us, God? Seems to be in that question. What would it take to assuage your wrath and your anger and your judgment, O oh God? Well, of course, he had already revealed that through Moses, and they just had ignored it. In contrast to the questions about sacrifices, God's answer through Micah is a clearly enunciated negative. Verse 8 of chapter 6. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth Jehovah require of thee, but to do justly, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with thy God. The same people, including prince, priest, and prophet, who would make their offerings to God, would then go out and defraud and kill. Justice, kindness, and humility before God were completely lacking in their lives. While their sacrifices were wholly insufficient, let none charge God's prophet with minimizing the sacrificial system because it was God-given. The prophet was not implying that God did or does not desire, command, or accept outward manifestations of worship and devotion. He's required these in every age, and he still does. It appears that these people were not so much intent on pleasing Jehovah as they were on trying to push back his wrath through their rituals so as to continue in their daily lives of iniquity. The main point of this passage, and to a degree of Micah's entire book, is that acts of worship, even when outwardly conforming to the law of God, are vain and hypocritical when not accompanied by a sincere heart and a virtuous life. However, this is neither the first nor the last statement of this principle of God's Word. Over three centuries earlier, Samuel sternly chastised King Saul for the same sort of failure. 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. Hath Jehovah's great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, he scolds Saul, as in obeying the voice of Jehovah? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry and teraphim. Because thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Again, Samuel's outcry was neither against Saul's plan to offer sacrifices or against God's system of offerings per se. However, to offer those particular sacrifices would have been both vain and abominable. The very sacrificial animals Saul had procured represented his rebellion against an edict and explicit command of God. Both the heart and the life of the king were far from Jehovah. And the slaughter and roasting of some animals, though outwardly complying with God's law, would not change that and please him. In the midst of David's humble prayer for forgiveness in the 51st Psalm, he writes in verses 16 and 17, For thou delightest not in sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou hast no pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Instead of the mere show of sorrow over sin, <clears throat> indicated by fasting, weeping, mourning, and the rending of their garments, in Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, the prophet admonished the nation of Judah on behalf of Jehovah, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 29, 13, we read familiar words where he accused the residents of Jerusalem of hypocritical worship and praise of God. He said, This people draweth nigh unto me, and with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but 
they have removed their heart far from me. The Lord chose these very words in his scathing rebuke of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15. This people, he says in verse 8, honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He then added that their worship was vain because it was the doctrines of men. Who can forget his judgment of worshipers in Matthew chapter 6, 1 through 7? Those who stand on the street corners and blow a trumpet when they give alms to attract attention. Those who, for pretense, make long prayers to be heard of men. They have their reward, the Lord says. Their hearts were not in it. Jesus told the woman at Jacob's well that true worshipers, the kind that God seeks are those who worship him in spirit and in truth. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Reliable exegetes have long <clears throat> believed that the genuineness and the sincerity of the worshiper is what the Lord has in mind when he says worship in spirit in this part of the verse. Such a worshiper will hardly be found living a reprobate life throughout the week. To state it another way, worshiping in spirit implies not only sincerity of heart and the acts of worship themselves, but also a devoted heart and life that undergirds the momentary devotional acts. The truth part of this uh, statement of the Lord is a reference to the Bible, and particularly for us, the New Testament. God's revealed truth is what he has spoken in his word, John 17, verse 17. The only source of information any human being has from which to learn what pleases God and does not please God in worship or in anything else. In this one passage, we have God's perfect worship formula. Past, present, and future worshipers. It covers all. Sincerity and truth balance each other fully and perfectly. Acts of worship, even when complying with the letter of the law, are hollow and vain if done as mere ritual or if offered by a corrupt heart. On the other hand, worship offered by one who is morally upright in every way and who is sincere in his acts of devotion fails to please God if it ignores avenues of worship that he has prescribed. Check with Nadab and Abihu on that, Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. It has never been either or of spirit and truth. It's always been both and. We've rightly tried to teach those in the religious world at large the wrongness of offering unauthorized acts of worship. We must continue to do so. But because of widespread ignorance and of many antinomian leaders among us, we must now teach many of the Lord's own people this same essential lesson. Let us never forget that as essential as it is to offer all and only those acts of worship that God has authorized, one can do this and still offer vain worship if it is irreverent and not sincere, and if it does not have pure daily living behind it. Those who conceive of the religion, or of true religion, as attending an hour of worship once a week, hardly giving a thought to God otherwise, have missed it entirely. And what of those who seem to believe that uh, as long as they're present long enough to pinch off a little bread and drink a little grape juice, they have done their duty. Then there are those who loudly sing, Purer in heart, O oh God, help me to be on Sunday morning, and then who apparently see no cons uh, inconsistency in polluting their minds the rest of the week by drinking from various entertainment cesspools. Others will forsake the assembly on the Lord's Day morning to go deer hunting 
or to go to a child's soccer game and then come in on Sunday evening and piously partake of the Lord's Supper and think they're pleasing God. I say they've wasted their time. There is no clearer principle in Scripture than that one cannot substitute outward and superficial acts of homage for a heart that is attuned to self and to the world. Let us all rededicate ourselves then to honoring God as we live daily, putting our hearts into it as we live daily, as well as letting our lips and our acts of devotion when we assemble be according to his will. God's plan of salvation for those who have not obeyed the gospel embraces these two principles of spirit and truth as well. One who would be saved from his past sins must genuinely want to be saved. And he must uh, consult the truth of God's word to understand what will bring him into fellowship with God through forgiveness of his sins. One might go through the motions of uh, being baptized, for instance, but do it to please some human being rather than to please God. Well, the outward act was correct if he was immersed, but the sincerity and the doing it in spirit are totally absent. The Lord teaches us that we must sincerely believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is who he said he was and proved himself to be. For he said in John 8 and verse 24, except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And we cannot frivolously say, oh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God again, to please some human being. But we must genuinely confess with our mouths, with our lips, that Christ is God's Son unto our salvation. Romans 10, verse 10. And if one actually repents, he proves his repentance by his reformation of life. So John said to the multitudes that came out to him in the wilderness, Matthew chapter 3, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. If you say you repent, prove that you're repenting. Let it be known that you are sincerely doing this. And then one must be baptized for forgiveness of sins. Not baptized just for any purpose or any reason. There are many reasons one might be baptized. But baptism is for a specific purpose, just like eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine on the Lord's day is for a specific purpose. And you cannot take away that purpose without destroying the significance of the act that it symbolizes. And so it is with baptism. One must sincerely enter the waters of baptism. Wanting to obey God is a good reason, but also understanding that his sins are still upon him until he has been baptized into Christ. For or unto the remission of those sins. So there must be the sincerity. The whole spirit and heart must be in it when one believes and repents and confesses his faith and is baptized. And one must do all of those things according to the truth of God's Word. Maybe there are some in the sound of my voice tonight who have not done that. We urge you with every fiber of our being to do so. Your soul for eternity hangs in the balance. Maybe those of us who are Christians have not been what we should have been as we worshiped. Our hearts were not really in it. Let us not be like Israel of old that brought God's wrath down upon it because they were doing the right things outwardly, but their hearts were not in it. And let us quickly repent if that describes us. Let's stand as we sing.